baby's brain and head don't fully develop still hasn't been definitively proven. But health officials are operating under the assumption that there is one. Brazil reported only 150 cases of microcephaly in 2014 before the virus arrived. It has recorded nearly 4,000 cases of the birth defect since October. Marcy Treadwell is a fetal medicine physician at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. She says it's possible that in many more babies, the virus is causing less severe forms of brain damage that will only become apparent later. We don't know the full range of the impact of the virus. Given that many people who get infected with Zika don't get sick at all, she says... There may be a whole host of women who have had the virus while pregnant, who have kids who are completely normal or that maybe appear completely normal but developmental issues as these kids get older and we start to see some of the impact we just don't know the range currently there's no treatment for zika nor is there a vaccine a half dozen cases of zika have already turned up in the u.s over the last two weeks all of them travelers returning to parts of latin america and the caribbean where the outbreak is raging cdc officials however predict any outbreaks in the u.s mainland will be localized relatively small as Americans have better access to screens and air conditioning to protect themselves from mosquitoes. Jason Bobian, NPR News. Over the years that we've covered the war in Syria, NPR's relied heavily on activists, journalists, and humanitarians from the region to help bring us the stories from inside the war zone. One of those people is Wissam Tariq. He's in Washington today, and we have invited him into our studios to bring us up today. Good to see you face to face. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. You have lately been working on getting airdrops to some of the parts of Syria that have been under siege. People are experiencing starvation, and international groups express concern that if these airplanes fly over to drop aid, they could be shot down. Where do you think stand? There have been two airdrops, one in Kuban, done by the U.S. government almost a year and a half ago, and the Russians, surprisingly say that they airdropped aid uh, in their resort uh, a few days ago. Their resort is another place that's been beset by starvation. Yes, absolutely. The UN now tells us that there are 400,000 people in these situations in 15 different spots living under strict siege. People starve. We believe that the numbers are way higher because the UN struggles with access. So actually, there are around 1 million Syrians now living in terrible weather, almost as cold as Washington is today. And people don't have electricity, water, food, fuel for heating. But let me be clear, dropping aid from the sky could be an emergency measure to save lives right now, but that is not the solution. This is not something sustainable. Is there a specific story you've heard in the last couple of weeks from somebody who is under siege? that really captures how desperate things are right now? Khulud, a mother, 38 years old, has three kids. She's trapped in Mount Bamiya, Sanaria and Damascus suffers. One of her daughters died last week because she doesn't have enough food. Do you know how old the daughter was? Less than two years. Khulud and her other two kids, and around almost a million Syrians, are trapped in a similar situation. How, how do you hear these stories of people like Hulu, this mother who you tell us about? That's what they do. I spend most of my time talking to people inside, on WhatsApp or Skype, and it's surprising, you know, they don't have food, but some of them have access to the internet. No word. The next round of UN Brotherhood Peace Talks is supposed to happen next week. The details are still unclear. You're going to Geneva for those talks. Do you see any hope that the international community can actually get on the same page and work together to end this? There is a political momentum where the Americans and the Russians want all parts of the conflict to sit and talk. This is the third round. Three the third round of peace talks. Of peace talks. In 2014 in Geneva, we've seen the Russians using tactics to make their position look queen, divided and make the regime look coherent, solid, one. And just last week, I was in New York at the Security Council, and when Mr. Dimastura, who is the special envoy of the General Security of the United Nations, working on resolving this conflict, was briefing the council. 
Oh, we're all surprised that the Russians asked for three names to be added to the opposition list. And these three names are people very close to the regime. So their tactic is to insert certain people on the opposition delegation who all go to Geneva. One of these guys will step out of the door. And one more time, we'll have hot lines. The opposition is divided. They will be terrible. Well, then this suggests that really there is no international cohesion, and the hope is to start really is very soon. Then, what we need to focus on is go to Geneva and try to bring the minimal for the Syrians. If it's not peace, then it's changing the war dynamic in the country, lifting the siege from population that is currently destroyed to make the condition for the population, for the Syrians, their Sam Paris is the Middle East Director of Avaz, a non-profit advocacy group. He is based in Beirut and joined us today in our studios here in Washington. Thanks very much for coming and speaking with us. Thank you. KQED news is coming up after a look at traffic. Here's Julie Duffy. Just an awful commute in the South Bay. We did got this accident between a big rig and a car. Southbound 101 before Hellier. Still blocking the right lane. That backup extends all the way to 85 in Mountain View. A same location, basically northbound 101 before Coyote Creek Golf Drive. A couple of vehicles here move to the shoulders. Heavy back to Dunn Avenue. And 680 southbound before Capital Expressway in San Jose. Two vehicles here have been cleared out of the right lane. Julie Deppish for KQED. That report was brought to you by Mothers Against Drunk Driving. Support for KQED comes from SV Colo, an Edge Connects company offering data center space for startups and mid-sized businesses based on focused on securing IT with fully staffed Tier 3 Edge data centers. Quotes available at svpolo.com. And from the law firm Fenwick & West. Fenwick serves the global needs of technology and life sciences companies, including financings and acquisitions, intellectual property, and litigation. Online at fenwick.com. It's KQED News, and I'm Devin Katayama. Three former fundraisers for San Francisco Mayor Ed Lee's campaign have been charged with a number of felony counts. Former political consultant Keith Jackson, former Human Rights Commissioner Nasli Mohajer, and Human Rights Commission staffer Zuba Mae Jones have all allegedly been involved in pay-to-play politics. The charges involve bribery, money laundering, campaign finance fraud, and grand theft. San Francisco District Attorney George Gascon announced the charges this afternoon. My office is committed to doing everything it can to ensure that people, the people's business is done with transparency and fairness, and above all, that it's never for sale. The FBI joined local authorities in the announcement. The local charges appear to flow from a years-long federal investigation and indicted more than two dozen defendants, including a state senator. Joining me to talk about it is KQED reporter Alex Emsley. Good to have you here. Hey, thanks, Devin. So all three charged today are names you're quite familiar with. Can you tell us why these three are now in the spotlight? It was a surprising announcement today, but it was also somewhat expected. I'm familiar with these names because they all came out in federal court fi filings involving that uh, case you referenced, the sweeping federal indictment that most people will remember as the Raymond Shrimp Boy Chow trial, right? They were all brought up in these uh, FBI transcripts of wiretaps, recorded phone conversations, that kind of thing. And uh, defense attorneys for Raymond Chow put those transcripts um, out into the public in a public court filing. So we've known about this for a few months. Charges were expected. The DA said that this was under investigation. Um, and then today we got that announcement. And part of the investigation, uh, we learned about this undercover investigator, Michael Anthony King, which is not his real name. He actually gave money, though, that allegedly went to pay down Mayor Ed Lee's 2011 campaign debt. So what did King get in return for that? So King, um, the pseudonym that he was going under, apparently, he was posing as a, a businessman based in Atlanta with sort of mafia ties, a, a, a mob-connected guy, right? And then he comes into San Francisco and um, starts making contact with these politically connected people, seeking access to construction deals, uh, businesses that he can invest in. 
Um, and he found some people who were open to that kind of illegal activity in allegedly uh, these former human rights uh, commissioner and staffer. So has Mayor Ed Lee responded? He initially responded um, in, to that court filing that I told you a while back saying, oh, this is just a, um, you know, a desperate move by a man who has a violent criminal past and is facing you know, very uh, serious charges. Um, today, his office uh, put out a statement with a little bit of a different tune saying that um, he, you know, condemns this activity uh, that was, you know, raising money basically on his behalf um, and that he's urging the district attorney to prosecute these charges to the fullest extent. So since his announcement today came as a bit of surprise, as you say, might we expect in the future more charges for more individuals that were part of this investigation? Many reporters asked that question today of the district attorney and the FBI. Um, they were cryptic. Basically, what we get is this is an ongoing investigation. There's a lot of speculation that pay-to-play politics, as you referenced, um, as, as uh, Raymond Chow's attorneys have referenced, as this kind of a term thrown around in San Francisco sometime, that it goes much, much further than these three individuals. Um, there's indications that uh, people in high political office knew that this was going on and allowed it to go on on their behalf. So we'll see. Well, thanks, Alex. Thank you, Devin. That's KQED's Alex Emsley, and I'm Devin Kadiyama, KQED News. Support comes from Stanford Healthcare, where every day Stanford medicine doctors provide innovative treatments and advanced patient care. Support for KQED comes from Raytheon WebSense, presenting Forcepoint, a global company helping to safeguard users' data and networks against insider threats and outside attackers in the cloud, on the road, and in the office. Forcepoint.com slash NPR. And from Notre Dame Dana Muir University. Located mid-peninsula off 101. Classes start year-round for evening bachelor's degrees with accelerated formats for most majors. Information and events at ndmu.edu. Expect a low of 46 degrees tonight in Santa Rosa. The forecast low for San Jose is 52. Northern California will be rainy overnight and tomorrow. Saturday afternoon, highs will range from 56 in Concord to 61 in Oakland. We should get a break from the rain on Sunday. Support for NPR comes from Move, working to help businesses stand out with a range of business cards and printed products for telling a company's unique story. Also offering print affinity, the ability to print a different image on every card. More at Move.com. Farmers Insurance, striving to use their experience with a variety of claims to know how to help customers protect themselves in the future. Tales of coverage are at Farmers.com slash Hall of Claims. And from the listeners of KQED. From NPR News, this is All Things Considered. I'm Ari Shapiro. Our next story has all the trappings of an ugly political scandal. Big money, corrupt officials, fleeced taxpayers, even a political operative turned informant complete with an FBI microphone stashed in his suit. It sounds like Washington intrigue. The Andrea Seabrook reports this has been playing out since last July in Allentown, Pennsylvania. There are only seven people on Allentown City Council, but the vote they took on Wednesday night was a big one. Uh, uh, Mr. Glazer. Yes. Mr. Green. Yes. The room is packed. No seats left. So citizens stand along the sides and the back of the room. The question at hand, should Allentown's mayor resign? Mr. President, I have seven years your name. Thank you, Mr. Hammond. Just about every one of these city council members was a longtime staunch ally of Mayor Ed Pulowski. Most got elected with his help. They're only calling for his resignation now after the FBI raided Pulowski's offices, four of his associates had been indicted, and the city's financial controller pleaded guilty last week to fraud. City Council President Ray O'Connell. Maybe it is too little too late. Maybe it is too little too late. But it is here. And it is now. Now, it's not common for the FBI to investigate small town local politics, much less raid the offices of a mayor. But in this case, Allentown is at the center of a pay to play scheme that could travel far outside Pennsylvania. 
The city is key, though. For most of the 20th century, Allentown had a booming economy. Mack trucks were built here. Western Electric made phones and other systems for Ma Bell. But by the year 2000, those companies were gone, along with most high-paying jobs. It's a classic Rust Belt story. Enter Mayor Ed Pulowski. He was instrumental in passing a state law that set up big money incentives for businesses to relocate and build in downtown Allentown. In the last few years, close to a billion dollars of taxpayer money has poured into development contracts with big businesses. But now, FBI documents filed with the federal indictments show that many of the companies who received those contracts were also big donors to Pulowski's political campaigns. After a close ally of the mayor wore an FBI wire, it became clear that Pulowski himself had rejiggered the city's bidding process. According to the charges, he was making sure those big contracts went to the right companies. People that were donating money to him, people that expected something in return, got help. This is attorney Eric Cowdell. He represents the former city controller who was pleaded guilty last week to fraud. Cowdell invokes that ever-true axiom of all political scandals, follow the money. In this case, the FBI is investigating everyone from the chairman of the Pennsylvania Democratic Party to at least one big-time fundraiser in national politics, Jack Rosen. He's raised serious money for both Clintons and Barack Obama. Oh yes, and Allentown Mayor Ed Pulaski. Jack Rosen's businesses have also made a lot of money in Allentown. Attorney Eric Cowdell says this might explain why all the federal scrutiny. The prosecutors, the U.S. attorneys that are assigned to this case are very capable and as it comes to um, criminal investigations, very dangerous. And I think that um, there are a lot of people who are incredibly nervous right now. As for the mayor, Pulaski skipped this city council meeting. After the unanimous vote calling on him to resign, he released a statement calling the move a stunt and a waste of time. For NPR News, I'm Andrea C. Rook. This week, the publisher Scholastic announced it would stop distributing a children's picture book titled A Birthday Cake for George Washington. The book was under heavy criticism for whitewashing the history of slavery, even though it was created by a multicultural team. A few months ago, another children's book called A Fine Dessert drew similar criticism. NPR's Ada Peralta looks at the challenges that writers, parents, and teachers face in trying to present such sensitive topics to young children. Allison Kreiner Brown is showing me around the offices of Teaching for Change in Washington, D.C. The place is full of picture books laid out on desks and shelves. Upstairs, they have a little public library. For years, the nonprofit, which advocates for a more inclusive curriculum in public schools, has been keeping track of what it considers to be some of the best and worst multicultural kids' books out there. Why do you keep that list? Oh, because there's so much to learn from that. A birthday cake to George Washington was just put on the bad shelf. It tells the story of Hercules, a slave George Washington used as a chef. It's a book full of smiles as Hercules and his daughter Delia take pride in making for the president. But the story glosses over the fact that Hercules and Delia are in bondage. And it's only in the note following the story that the author writes that Hercules escaped, leaving his daughter behind. It, it is, it's almost as if the book presents that because he had moments of happiness and because he took pride in doing his work, that outweighs the fact that he was enslaved. And that cannot ever be a part of, of telling any story about someone who was held in bondage. Brown says that kind of simplistic, idealized narrative in a picture book is just a reflection of the adult world. This is a country, she says, that wants to believe the United States started as the land of the free and the home of the brave. The nation didn't start like that for everyone. So uh, as much as we struggle with it, um, how to then have these difficult conversations with our children, with things that we're wrestling with ourselves, I think is, is very tough for a lot of people. The children aren't waiting around for adults, says Ebony Elizabeth Thomas, a professor of education at the University of Pennsylvania. She studies how schools approach touchy subjects like slavery, and she spent time with students at a Philadelphia middle school. I found out that kids are not only ready to discuss these topics, they are already discussing these topics with their friends. The students were reading a book about a runaway slave in Canada, and Thomas 
says they were making sophisticated connections between the historical fiction and the realities of the Black Lives Matter movement today. So while kids are already grappling with some of the world's ugliness, she says adults are still clinging to a Victorian ideal of an innocent child. So the innocence of the ideal child must be protected at all costs. We must keep um, the dirty secrets of our society away from those kids. And um, I think that kids are seeing those contradictions. That instinct is familiar to writer Matt de la Peña. You know, I'm a new dad. I'm a 20-month-old daughter. And you really just want to protect your daughter so much from the sadness. And you feel like, you know, she's going to see it eventually on her own. But then you have to take a step back and say, you know what, my need to protect isn't as important as for her to see the truth. The truth is something De La Peña thinks about a lot. His books for young adults often deal with the harsh realities of crime and violence, and he thinks that's valuable to kids. Young readers have a chance to experience very scary and sad and dark things in books. It's kind of the safest way to experience these things for the first time. De La Peña just won a Newbery Medal for his book, The Last Stop on Market Street. It's about CJ, a black kid, taking a bus ride to the soup kitchen with his grandma. At one point, CJ asks why the poor neighborhood is always so dirty. Sometimes, when you're surrounded by dirt, the wise grandma says, you're a better witness for what's beautiful. Ada Peralta, NPR News. You're listening to All Things Considered from NPR News. The Mediterranean Sea is still a deadly place for asylum seekers trying to reach Europe. More than 40 people, including 17 children, died at sea near two doing, tiny man? Greek islands today. Joanna Kakissis joins us from the island of Lesbos, a main gateway for migrants into the EU. Hi, Joanna. Hi, Ari. Uh, tell us what happened today. Two wooden boats sank today. Um, and on those boats, there were scores of asylum seekers. Uh, the boat sank near these two very tiny Greek islands, uh, Faramakonisi and Kalolimnos. Uh, they're in the South Aegean Sea, and there are hardly any people actually living on those islands. Rescue staff is stretched so thin along several Greek islands and along the Greek shoreline um, that uh, they just couldn't keep up with all the boats coming in. The boats are actually launching from all over the Turkish coast. You're on the island of Lesbos, which receives so many asylum seekers. There's actually a processing center there. What have you seen at the processing center lately? So today, you know, lots there were lots of people there because there have been so many landings in the last two or three days. Uh, 15, 20 boats coming a day, and those boats usually have between 50 to 60 people on board. Um, and there were a lot of families, and they were very shocked at the news of the drownings, you know, and of course they all think themselves it could have been us. Uh, most of the people I spoke to, they can't swim, and on top of that, you know, they were freezing. It's, it's, it's freezing over here, it's so cold. Um, one Iraqi dad had told me that he actually put his four-month-old daughter inside his jacket with her little life vest on um, to keep her from freezing to death because he was almost as worried about that as he was about her drowning. Um, he was just terrified. Uh, and uh, everyone is still talking also about a three-year-old boy who froze to death just a couple of days ago here. And I actually saw the boat from the shore in the distance. It was just sort of floating in between Greek and Turkish waters. And the rescue boat was trying to get to it. And by the time the rescue boat reached the, the boat, the migrant boat, the little boy had already frozen to death because he'd been in the water more than an hour. So this, this is all very real. These are all very real fears of people at the migrant camp we're talking about today. Joanna, when the weather is so cold and the water is so choppy in January, you would think that people would be too afraid to cross and yet thousands are still coming. Why? Well, you know, again, what people have told me today, what they've told me all along, all of last year, the wars